Isn't that awesome? God is awesome. I just felt like during the um, offertory when they were singing that God was just receiving that. You know, the scripture says he inhabits the praises of his people. And God is pleased with us just worshiping him. You know, sometimes we're so focused on God, I need this, that we forget that God has a need. Anybody who loves has a need for that love to be received and be returned. And you know, it ministers to God when you love him and when you just worship him. And I tell you, God is pleased. I remember back in the very beginning of our ministry when we only had like four or five people that were coming to our church in Seagaville, Texas, and we met in a place that we couldn't pay the bills and so they turned off the electricity and we were sitting there in the dark and we had electrical spools with wine bottles and candles in it and that's what we used for light and we would sing for an hour or two at a time and then I would get up and minister and stuff. That may be why nobody came, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, we would just worship the Lord an hour or two at a time and I remember during one of those times that Jamie saw this. I. I don't know if it was like an open vision or if she pictured it in her mind, but she saw the angels of God dancing over us and twirling and, and uh, involved in our praise. And that's exactly what, what is it? Zephaniah three seventeen says that the Lord will rejoice over us. He will, uh, how does it go? The Lord that God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save thee. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. And those words in the Hebrew means to violently twist and twirl and dance. And this is what the scripture says. Did you know that God inhabits our praises? This blesses God that people take a week off and come just to hear the word. You could be doing anything and you're putting God first. Man, that's awesome. You know, there's a lot of people that but they won't do this. They won't allow themselves to think that God is really pleased with me because we've been taught that at our very best, we have to say, oh God, I'm still a worm and, and uh, it's amazing that you will use me. And there's a partial truth to that, that in ourself, that Paul said, in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. But we've been born again and God inhabits our praises and God loves us. You know, Jamie and I, when we first got started, we were involved in Catherine Kuhlman's ministry and I remember not long after we got married, uh, we were in one of her services and we saw blind eyes open and deaf ears open and great miracles and Jamie and I were just awestruck. And after it was over, everybody just left. And we were thinking, how can they just leave? We're in the presence of the Lord. The ground is holy ground. And we sat there until we were the last people in the auditorium. We just sat there soaking it up. And I was ministering in Omaha, Nebraska, and I think we had seen a blind eye open or anyway, it was some real miraculous things that happened. And as I was getting ready to leave, I saw people just sitting there in the presence of the Lord, afraid to move or didn't want to move. They just wanted to dwell in the present. And I remember thinking that that's exactly what we felt. And now people are feeling that in my meeting. And as I was driving back to the hotel, I just said, thank you, Father. And I was thanking him that he had allowed me to be a part of flowing through to somebody else. And for the first time, as I was saying, thank you, Lord, the Lord spoke to me and he says, well, thank you, Andrew. And when I first heard that, I thought, well, that's not God. God would never thank me for anything. And you know, as soon as I had that thought, I got to thinking that's, that's not what those scripture says. That's not what that verse we were talking about. And I had to start letting God tell me that he loved me and that he was pleased with me and that he inhabited my praises. And God will say thank you to you. God likes you. God likes hanging out with you. And I know some of you, this is a brand new thought. I've been teaching on how to hear the voice of God. And did you know that God will say things like that to you, but most people will not accept that. They will immediately think that wasn't me. That wasn't God. That was me. God would never do this. God would never tell me to do certain things. And we limit what God can do but God will speak to you like that. You know, the Lord calls us his children. 
And in the same way as you're pleased with your children, and you know that they aren't perfect, and you remember what they've done wrong, but you just, you enjoy your children anyway. Did you know God loves you? And God wants you to feel his pleasure. He wants you to know how pleased he is with you. I ministered in um, uh, St. Joseph, Missouri one time on a Sunday morning. There's about 400 people in the church. And I started by saying, how many of you want to please God more than anything else? And since we were in church, everybody's hand went up. And then I said, all right, now I want you to be honest. How many of you actually please God? And did you know out of 400 people, there was two people, about a 10-year-old boy and a 12 or 13-year-old girl that raised their hand, and nobody else raised their hand. And I said, can you see why uh, there's so much frustration if, the, if your desire is to please God, and yet nobody feels that they do it? Proverbs 13, uh, 12 says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. And if you have a desire to know the Lord and have a relationship with the Lord and yet you don't feel like you ever do it and you, aren't, you don't please God, that's a recipe for being uh, discouraged and being depressed. And this is where so many people live. But I'm telling you, God loves you. God will tell you awesome things, but we have to tune our hearing. You know, I'm not going to go back and rehearse everything I said last night, but real quickly, let me just... Uh, point out again that in the Old Testament with Moses, God spoke to him in an audible voice. Number 789. He spoke to him from off the mercy seat between the cherubs and in an audible voice he spoke to Moses. And I was thinking about God, if what we have is better than what the Old Testament people had, then how come you don't speak in an audible voice today? Now, I know God can do it and it does happen sometimes, but it's not the norm. It's it's rare. It's not the normal way that God speaks. And um, I was praying about this, and the Lord spoke to me that when we get born again, there's twice in, in 1 Corinthians that it says we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And in the temple, there's a holy of holies, and that's where God was speaking to Moses from. And God, now our spirit is the holy of holies. It's the temple and God dwells in us and God doesn't speak to us from off of some physical altar that comes through our physical ears. He speaks to us through our spirit. And most people miss this. Let me turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter two and sh share some things. I wish I had time to go through this entire chapter, but I've got a lot I wanna say and I'm going to have to skip through some of this, but Paul here in the first chapter, he was talking about that they, you know, the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. The way this world thinks is perverse. And if you can't see that today, you aren't paying attention. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter five, verse 20, that in the latter days, they'll call evil good and good evil and sweet, bitter and bitter sweet and all of these things, and we are living in those days. The world is absolutely crazy. They are absolutely crazy. I could spend a lot of time verifying that, but unless you are living in a monastery or a nunnery someplace, you ought to know that. Amen. I mean, they have lost their ever-loving mind. So... Anyway, he's talking about that, and, he, and then in chapter 2, he says, we didn't come using man's wisdom and excellency of speech. We were speaking the wisdom of God in a mystery, even things that are hidden from the world. They aren't hidden in the sense that God doesn't want anybody to know it, but God speaks in a different language. You know, Carrie Pickett down here has used this illustration a number of times that when she went to Russia, she had to learn Russian. And at first, she didn't know what they were saying and had to use an interpreter, but now she's become fluent in Russian. And now that she knows the language, she can understand what they're saying. People don't know God's language. And because of it, it's like God is talking, but they aren't getting it because he speaks a different way than this world speaks. It's not about self-promotion. It's not about you getting everything you can. It's not all about you. It's about learning that the way up in God's kingdom is down. It's completely contrary to the world system. If you humble yourself, then God will lift you up. But if you lift yourself up, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. 
Proverbs 16, 18, and on and on you could go. God's system is different and he's speaking constantly, but we aren't getting it because we don't know the language. I also used this example last night that it's like God broadcasting on one frequency and everybody tuned in to a different frequency. It's not that God's not broadcasting, it's that we aren't tuned in. We haven't inclined our ear to hear his voice. And so this is what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And then he says in verse 9, I think I mentioned this last night, but in verse 9, it says, But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. And people have taken this verse to justify saying, Well, we can't know the ways of God. We even write songs about it. Further along, we'll understand why. Further along, we'll know all about it and stuff. And there's people that have just embraced that we're down here and you just, you can't know, you can't hear the voice of God. You can't be led by God. And they have used verses like this, but that is not what's being said. He's quoting an Old Testament verse before people got born again and before they were renewed. And he's saying that just in your natural self with your physical peanut sized brain and your five senses, you cannot hear from God and be led by God. But the next verse says, God hath revealed them unto us. It says, I hadn't seen, nor ear has heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for him, but God has revealed them unto us by his spirit. This isn't saying that you can't know the things of God. It's saying just the opposite. That without God, without the inspiration of his spirit, without tuning into the right frequency, without using your spirit man, you can't know the things of God. But now that you are born again, it should be normal for us to hear God speak to us and give us direction. That isn't abnormal. It is normal. That's the normal Christian life. If your life isn't supernatural, it's superficial. God didn't make anybody to be just natural. Everything about you should be supernatural. If you can justify everything in your life by you did this, you're a self-made man or a woman. You haven't tapped into God. I had a man that bought Jamie and me cars for I think it was 12 years and he would buy us new cars and make the payments on it. And he bought us a uh, Suburban that was way nicer than anything I could ever afford. It was really tripped out. It had this rope lighting inside and I'd have people see it and they'd say, what do you do? And I'd say, well, I'm a preacher. And they'd say, preachers shouldn't have something this nice. And you know what? I actually got a little embarrassed and I was talking to him one time and I said, you know, it's embarrassing some of these cars that you bought me and boy, he just came right back and he says, if you aren't embarrassed at your level of prosperity, then God's not your source. He says, God paves his street with gold. He uses gems for the foundation stones. God's El Shaddai, not El Chipo. And if you can look and say, well, I did all of this by my effort, you haven't tapped into God. God is exorbitant. He is more than enough. One of his names is El Shaddai, the many-breasted one. He's more than enough. I'm telling you, we have limited God. And so we can know the voice of God. We can hear it, but it has to come by the Spirit. And then he goes on to say in verse 11, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but it doesn't put a period there, but the Spirit of God. You don't know it in just your natural self, but the Spirit of God knows the things of God, and we have received that Spirit. In verse 12, now we have received not the spirit of the world. You didn't get just a, uh, your born again spirit isn't human. It's not got the limitations of, of the human spirit before it's born again. When you got born again, you became a brand new creature. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. One that had never existed before is what some of the translations say. It says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, it says, Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. 
not in the world to come, in this world. Your spirit is not of this world. It is of God. And it goes on to say, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. I'm going to skip that, but that's awesome right there. In verse 14, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. And brothers and sisters, sad to say, this is where the average Christian lives. They just can't perceive the things of God. It's foolishness unto them because they're on a different frequency. They are in the flesh, and you have to be in the Spirit in order to be able to hear the things of God. The natural man, this isn't talking about just lost people. This is talking about just the natural part of you. Even if you're born again, you've still got a natural man left. You've still got a mind that has to be renewed. You've still got a physical body that gets tired and it's not a spiritual body yet. It's a physical body. And so even Christians have a natural mind and the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. To hear the voice of God, you've got to learn how to walk in the Spirit and to hear with your spiritual ears. Jesus would say, any man that has ears to hear, let him hear. Every person in the crowd had physical ears. He wasn't talking about these ears. He was talking about listening with your heart. You can hear God. You, and anyway, and I got so much I'd love to say in the next verse. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. What does it mean that we have the mind of Christ? Does this just mean that we have a few instructions from the Lord every once in a while? He speaks to us every once in a while. We can get a little nugget from the Lord when we press in. No, it, we literally have the mind of Christ. Everything that Jesus knows, your born again spirit knows. You have the mind of Christ. It says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 10, it says, put on the new man, which after God is created, or excuse me, that's Ephesians 4, 24. That's a great one, amen. But in Colossians 3, 10, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. When you got born again, you have a mind in your spirit. I keep pointing to my belly because the Bible says in your belly, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the spirit that they that believe upon him would receive. So you're, I don't know if that's only symbolism or whatever, but anyway, your spirit is somewhere down here, amen. And in your spirit, you have a mind. You have a new man that has been renewed in knowledge, after the image of him that created him. Not just human thinking, but supernatural thinking. There is such a thing as what I call revelation knowledge, where you just know things. You know, uh, Simeon came into the temple because he was led by the Spirit and he was told of the Lord that he wouldn't die until he had seen the Lord's Christ. God just spoke these things to him. Anna came into the temple. There's... Thing, you just know things. You have the mind of Christ. And here's the point I'm trying to get across. Having the mind of Christ is better than having an audible word from God occasionally. You know everything that God knows. It's in your spirit. It's not in your brain. It's in your spirit. Another scripture on this is 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, that you have received an unction. The word unction means a special endowment of power or an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. It didn't say some things. You know all things. All things. In the Greek, that word all means all. Either the Bible is accurate in what it's saying or it's inaccurate. 
Do you really believe that you know all things? If that's true, then why do we go through life as if we don't know all things? Why do we go through life singing, well, further along, we'll know all about it. Cheer up, my brother. You can't hear God down here, but in the sweet by and by, it'll be worth it. I'm telling you, you can have steak on the plate while you wait. We have the mind of Christ. That is better than what Moses had. Moses longed for what you and I have. We've got the mind of Christ, but you've got to learn how to access it. And all of these verses are saying you can't access it if you're in the flesh. You have to be focused on the things of God. I'm going to say some things that I know some of you won't like, but uh, what's new? I do this on a regular basis. But did you know many of the things that we use to entertain ourselves with, it is not on God's frequency. You're watching shows where there's nudity, there's inappropriate sexual behavior, on and on we could go. And you know what? God doesn't speak through that. That is not God's language. That's not the way he broadcasts. And all of the time that you spend on that frequency means that you are going to be unplugged from the Lord and that you aren't going to be hearing Him. And did you know the more time you spend in the flesh, you get to where that becomes the default. That's who you are. But there is a new you on the inside, the spiritual man. And if you could ever understand this, that God's not trying to clean up your flesh, your physical body, and your mind, your will, and your emotions. God is not in just trying to help you get better. You are a completely brand new person in the Spirit. You have already obtained everything that there is in Christ, but it's in your spirit. And you don't have to do something to get better. You are perfect in your spirit. The rest of the Christian life is just focusing on what you have. And you know, uh, Carrie and I were doing our Tuesday night live Bible study right before we came over here. And we had one lady, I, I was talking about these same things, what I was going to talk about. And one lady says, how do you know that what you're discerning in your spirit, what you're feeling in your spirit is accurate? And the way I answered that is to say that we have the mind of Christ, but how do you know that those thoughts are God's thoughts and not yours? It's because this written word is also the mind of Christ. It is a written version of what is in your spirit. And so anytime you have an impression or a leading of the Lord, what you do is you check it with the written record of that and it'll have to bear witness. It'll never violate this. And actually when you are reading the word, your born-again spirit will immediately identify with that. It'll just grab hold of it. Yes, that's what you knew in your spirit already. And so this is like a mirror. You hold it up, and if what you are feeling is you can see it in here, well, then that came from your spirit. We had another question. Somebody says, can the devil uh, tell you truth? And I said, if the devil could speak the truth, he wouldn't be the devil. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 44, that the devil is a liar from the beginning. He, when he speaks, he can't speak the truth. Now, he will take a partial truth and he will wrap it in a lie. But his overall statement, it, if he could speak the truth, he wouldn't be the devil. Amen? He will always contradict this. So anyway, one of the points I'm trying to get across tonight is... That when the Lord speaks to you, he doesn't say, Andrew, go start a Bible college. I want you to start a Bible college. That's not the way the Lord speaks. See, that's a, that's a carnal person. That's a person that's in the flesh. That you are wanting God to speak to you through some external way. You're wanting to hear with your physical ears or you're wanting to have somebody come and give you a prophecy or something. But the way God speaks to you, I have the mind of Christ. And my spirit is constantly in tune with the Lord. And God tells me that he wants me to start a Bible school, but he doesn't say, Andrew, I want you. He, my spirit has God's mind in it. 
And God just gives me this desire to start a Bible college. Let me show you another verse. See, everything I'm going to tell you is in the Word. The Word will verify these things. Look at this in Psalms chapter 37. And this is how you hear the voice of God, how you are led by the voice of the Lord. Psalms chapter 37. Let's start in verse 1. It says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. You know, every scripture, every scripture, even the begats, is God-breathed. And if you would take it and look at it and analyze it, every scripture in the Bible will speak to you. Look at this. It says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. How many of you have looked at what's going on in our nation and all of the perversion and all of the things that are going on and you've fretted, you've worried, you've wondered where this is going? The mind of Christ is completely contrary to this. This is the mind of Christ that's written down and it tells you not to worry about it, not to fret. Now it didn't tell you not to be concerned and it doesn't tell you not to get involved but we, we shouldn't be like the world that are just overcome and depressed and discouraged about the way things are going. See, this is what your spirit is telling you. And when you read this, if you would open up your heart, God will speak to you and tell you, no, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I'm going to win. And he will encourage you. The next verse says, For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. And man, I could preach on every one of these verses. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land and, and uh, thou shalt be fed. And verily thou shalt be fed. In verse 4, delight thyself also in the Lord and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. This doesn't mean that if you are delighting yourself in the Lord that God will just give you whatever you want. You want a brand new car. You want a $100,000 car. You want a $2 million house. You want a new wife a new husband, you want a new job, you want to win the lottery. That's not what this is saying. This is saying that when you delight yourself in the Lord, God puts his desires in your heart. When you get born again, you were recreated and in the spirit you have the mind of Christ. You also have the emotions that go with that. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 says, the fruit of the spirit is love. Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. All of these things are in you 100% of the time. If you aren't feeling love, it's because you aren't in the spirit. You're in the flesh. You're on a different frequency. You are focused on something else. But when you are in tune with your spirit, you'll always have love. Always. There is never a time that love ever runs out. There's never a time that you don't feel love. I've had people spit in my face. I've been kidnapped. I've been threatened to be killed. I'm lied about all kinds of things, but you know what? There is no justification for me being depressed and discouraged. Now there's reasons, but there's not a justification for it because in my spirit, I've got the love of God and it's just a choice. Am I gonna walk in the spirit or am I gonna walk in my flesh? Am I going to go by how I feel or am I going to go by who I am in the spirit? See, that's the mind of Christ. I remember when Jamie and I moved to Pritchett, Colorado and God told us to go. It was very obvious. We left everything. For the first time in our ministry, it looked like we were going to live and not die. In Childress, we were finally eating on a regular basis. It looked like we were going to survive. And then I went and held a meeting in Pritchett, Colorado, 144 people in the town, 10 people in the church. And we saw a man raised from the dead. And the people came to me the last night of the meeting and says, you can't come in here and overturn everything we believe and then just leave. You got to stay. And I said, you got to be kidding I said, nobody would live in Pritchett, Colorado. If this isn't the end of the world, you can see it from here. It's that close. I said, there is no way I'm ever moving to Pritchett, Colorado. And they said, you can't do this. You owe it to us. So anyway, I told them no. And anyway, before we got back home to Childress, Texas, I knew I was supposed to go. I just knew it. 
There was nothing in the natural that made me want to go, but I just knew it was the mind of Christ. The Lord didn't say, Andrew, go to preach at Colorado. I wanted to go. He put his desires in my heart, and I wanted to go. I couldn't wait to get there. And so anyway, we went to preach at Colorado, and while we were there, uh, there, the church grew from 10 to 100 because of this guy that was raised from the dead. And in a town of 144 people, that's pretty good percentages. And so anyway, we were ministering, things were going good, but the elders, there was two or three elders and they were all custom combiners and they left on the wheat harvest from like March through October or something like that and they were gone. And they felt that we needed uh, elder to stay there with me to help run the church and so I said well okay and and they suggested this one guy and this guy was a nice guy what'd you say oh did I tell this one last night I, I tell it so many times I thought I told it at the Bible study so anyway you've heard that story but I said I said never again as soon as that guy turned on me I said, I knew I wasn't supposed to do it. Did you know that was the mind of Christ on the inside of me? And there are so many times, I've, I made a decision that I'm never gonna let that go again. That I am never gonna not follow the peace that's in my heart. You've got love, joy, and peace. Oh, here's the reason I was telling that story. I got off on the wrong story. So anyway, when we went there and everything went south and this guy turned against us, I was beginning to feel depressed and discouraged because God, I gave up uh, Childress, Texas. We were finally surviving. It looked like we were gonna live and I left there to come here and these people hate me and they don't appreciate me and I was just getting discouraged and I was waiting on Jamie and the boys to go to bed and then I was gonna go down into the a basement and throw a pity party and just talk about how unfair all of this stuff was. And so while I was waiting on them to go to bed, I just sat down at the table and I just flopped my Bible open and it flopped open to uh, Galatians 5.22. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. And when I saw that, I thought, God, I know that in my spirit I have these things, but in my flesh, I'm hurting, I'm miserable, I'm depressed, I'm discouraged, and I felt like I would have, I would have enjoyed having a pity party. I'd feel better to just let it out and let my feelings out. And you know what? The Lord didn't say anything else to me. He's not going to argue with you. He just reminded me of this truth. And then while I was waiting on the, Jamie and the boys to go to bed, I just was sitting there thinking on it and I thought, do I, am, am I gonna really go against what I know is in my spirit, what God has told me? And am I just gonna go by my emotions just because I feel them so strongly? And I had a choice to make. Was I gonna be in the spirit or was I gonna be in the flesh? Now again, I'm not denying that you have emotions. And I don't, when I sit there and have negative emotions, I don't deny that they exist, but I deny that that's all there is. And I deny that that is the real me. That is the unsaved part of me. That's the part of me that hadn't been born again. My born again part has love, joy, peace, all of the fruit of the spirit. And I'm gonna choose to walk in that. That's the mind of Christ. And so you know what? I just sat there and refused to give in to those emotions. And I went down in the basement and instead of complaining, I left my hands and threw gritted teeth because I didn't feel it. I started saying, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> thank you, Jesus, that I left a good thing in Childress and came here to where people hate me and are <laughs> saying that I'm stealing and lying. And I just started praising God. But you know what? I, when you do it, all of a sudden you prime the pump and pretty soon I started thinking, but God, you love me. And I, you know, before long, I was worshiping the Lord and having an awesome time. <laughs> Every single person, you have that on the inside of you. That is the mind of Christ. But most of the time we have, we've been deceived into thinking that, no, what I feel, that's the real me. That's the carnal you, if it violates the word of God. 
And I'm not saying that it's not part of you. You aren't only spirits. You have a soul and you live in a body. And so you don't deny that these things exist, but you don't indulge it and you don't live out of your flesh. The moment you start doing that, the moment you start singing, oh God, I know your word says that you love me and you'll never leave me nor forsake me, but I don't feel like you're here. And so we start praying, come Lord Jesus, just come and be with us today, which is in total opposition to everything the word of God says. And then you pray, oh God, go with us as we leave this place. We ask you to just stretch your hand out and touch this person and bring healing to us. All of those things are contrary to what the word says. By his stripes you were healed. He never leaves you. He's always with you. Well, I know what the word says, but I don't feel it. Well, then your feelings are wrong. I have people come to me all the time. Would you please pray that God would just pour out his love in my life? I said, no, that's contrary to the word. <laughs> well, why is that contrary? Because he's already poured out his love. He's his love has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. You got love, joy, and peace. Are you going to go by the word of God? Are you going to let the mind of Christ dominate you? Or are you going to live in the flesh? Amen. I know people just, you can't live this way. Well, don't wake me up because this is how I'm living. I, re I don't do it perfectly, but I refuse to just go by how I feel and by how things look. He puts his desires in our heart. And one of the ways, like for instance, when the Lord told me to start the Bible school, I never wanted a Bible school. I'd had people ask me about starting a Bible school and I, I had a desire to disciple people, but I didn't think Bible school was the way to do it. I never went to Bible school personally and I met a lot of people who came out of Bible school who had an attitude thinking they were superior to everybody else and that because they had a diploma somehow or another that made them spiritual and they weren't spiritual and it was obvious and I just didn't want my name to be on something like that. And so I had basically rejected the idea of having a Bible school, I didn't want it. Every time somebody talked about it, it did not bless me. And then I was over in England. I was with Charlie and Jill, and we were in England at uh, Cannock and doing one of the tent revivals there. And a man, um, uh, George Hill, was up preaching, and he was talking on leadership, and he said, if you aren't reproducing yourself, if you aren't training up people that can do what you're doing, then you're ultimately gonna be a failure because you will not live forever. And I agreed 100% with what he was saying. And I'd already seen that principle. And I was saying, but God, how do I do it? I'm doing everything I can. I'm on, I was on, at the time, I was only on radio. I said, I'm on radio. I'm putting out thousands of tapes. I'm doing everything I know. And all of a sudden, I just had the thought about start a Bible college. And instead of resisting it, the way I always had, I thought that's it. And God showed me how to do a Bible college differently than just imparting knowledge that we could actually disciple people. And I won't spend the time to explain all that, but the Bible college, like for instance, like what Matt was saying, this is unique, that the Bible is our textbook. So many Bible schools never open the Bible. They read books about the Bible. We teach the Bible. You have to go on missions trip. You have to have uh, certain hours that you put into the community. You have to do things. It's not only instruction. It's more like a trade school where you train people how to do it and then you put them in a situation where they have to do it. And anyway, when I saw it, all of a sudden the desire for a Bible college overwhelmed me. And I mean for nearly a week, I stayed up drawing pictures of what our Bible college would look like just so happens it looks like this. <laughs> and you know what? It was just desire. And my desire flip-flopped so much that I said, this can't be me. I, I don't change my mind like that. I'm kind of a plotter. I do things uh, deliberately and stuff. And for me to just totally change in my mindset like that was totally different. I remember when Jamie and I were in um, Seagoville, Texas, and we stayed there for two years and this is where we had five to 10 people maximum coming. We were sitting around those electrical spools with the wine bottles and, and, uh, and candles in there. 
And anyway, people would tell me, these people don't want you. They don't want you here. Leave. Go somewhere where you're wanted. But you know what? I loved Seagaville, Texas. I just, man, was constantly dreaming. I was seeing all kinds of things, and I just loved being there. It was awesome. And then one day I was down at our church building praying, and I happened to look out the window, and I said, this is the ugliest place I think I've ever seen in my life. I, I, I just, I, it stopped me. I was walking, praying, and I was walking by this window, and I stopped and looked down, and I said, this place is the pits. Who would live here? And I mean, my love turned to hatred within 10 seconds. And it shocked me. And I said, God, what is going on? I said, how could I just change from loving this place and praying for these people to thinking I can't wait to get out of this place? And I spent probably two hours praying in tongues saying, God, what's going on? And the Lord used this verse and other verses to show me that this was my heart that it was, the time was up. I had accomplished what God wanted me to do. I think really he sent me there for me, not for the people I was ministering to. I learned a lot in Childress, I mean in Seagaville, and he told me it was just time to go. And so I was praying, and all of a sudden, I think this was like August, I'm not sure the exact date, but it was like August, and I said, well, God, if I'm supposed to leave, where do I go? And I didn't get an answer on that one, but I said, well, when am I supposed to go? And he told me, November the 1st. I just all of a sudden knew. It's not like he says, November the 1st, you will leave. It's just like all of a sudden I asked the question, when am I leaving? And November the 1st came to me. So I prayed about it for a couple of hours. And finally I went home and I was going to tell Jamie. I said, I, I, I don't know how to tell you this, but God told me we're supposed to leave. And before I could tell Jamie anything, I got home and there was a for sale sign in our front yard. <laughs> And I said, what happened? And they said, the landlord came by and said, they're selling the house and we got to be out of here on November the 1st. <laughs> and it was a confirmation that that was God. You know what? I never heard anything audible. I didn't have a prophecy come to me. It, it was a desire of my heart. I had a desire for that place. And all of a sudden the desire evaporated and I desired to get out of there. God put his desires in my heart. I knew that someday I'd be on television. God told me I would, and I knew that from the very beginning. But I, again, television is super expensive. We spend well over a million and a quarter dollars a month just in paying television bills. That's not including anything else that we do. It's expensive, and I knew that it could either make or break the ministry, but I knew someday we'd do it, but I just had no desire to expose myself to that and put the ministry at risk and possibly everything I'd spent decades trying to build, see it just all destroyed. And so uh, I, I had no desire to go on television. I had a local guy here that wanted to put me on three television stations and I never would do it because I, I knew eventually I'd do it, but it just had no desire to do it. And then in 1998, I was praying about some things, long story, but all of a sudden I desired to go on television. And it was so strange that my desire just changed. All of a sudden, I wanted to be on television. And I was so excited, I stayed up for nearly a week drawing the set. I knew exactly what the set would look like. I knew exactly how I'd minister. I just knew these things. It's the mind of Christ. I never heard a voice. I didn't get a prophecy. I just knew it. This is how we hear from the Lord. Now, there can be other ways. You can have dreams and visions and prophecies and confirmations. I'm not saying it's the only way, but the dominant way that God talks to you is you just have the mind of Christ, and once you get on His frequency, once you get your mind stayed upon the Lord, that's what it's talking about when it says, delight yourself in the Lord. When you are tuned in to the spirit and you aren't letting your emotions dominate you but you are listening to God God will lead you by your desires and I know that that's scary to a lot of people because they say well man at one time I desired uh, prostitutes I desired dope I desired liquor uh, man I can't trust my desires well it's obvious that not all of your desires are from the Lord but you know how you discern this? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says, the word of God is quick. That means 
alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Your spirit is a part of you that's born again. It never fluctuates. It's sealed by the Holy Spirit. It doesn't get contaminated. You don't lose anything when you sin and mess up. Your spirit retains holy. It's the part of you that has the mind of Christ. And it says the word divides between soul and spirit and the thoughts and the intents of the heart. You judge it by the word. So you say, is this desire from God? Well, you go to the word because again, the word is the mind of Christ written down. And I can guarantee you, anything that your born again spirit is discerning and telling you to do, it will match this word perfectly. Now this puts a responsibility upon you to know the word. And if you don't know the word, it's like what Carrie was talking about. You don't know the language yet. You don't know what this word means. There's no way you're going to be able to carry on a conversation. And the average Christian doesn't know the word. And so therefore, there's, it's hard for them to judge it. If you're in that situation, and if you don't know the word yet, this is when you need to really depend upon somebody who is spiritually mature and that you can see the power of God operating in their life. And you need to let this person mentor you and check these things that you say God is telling you. But ultimately, you need to get to where you know the word and you can sit there and judge it by the word itself. And there's a lot of people say, well, the Bible doesn't tell you to buy this house, to buy this car. It doesn't say it in those words, but there's principles that guide every decision that you make. For instance, I've had students come to this Bible college and they see me and the other instructors that have been walking with the Lord for over 50 years and we've grown and now God is blessing us. I've got a brand new truck that somebody gave me. It was a I think a sixty-seven or $69,000 truck. I didn't buy it, it was given to me. And people see that and they say, well, man, if God will do that for Andrew, he'll do it for me. And so they just start, in the name of Jesus, I've got this desire for an $80,000 vehicle and I believe God's given it to me. There's nothing in the Bible that forbids it. Yes, there is. It says first the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. Have you ever believed for $10? Have you ever believed for $20? You got to start at the bottom rung at the ladder. You don't just work your way up. Jesus said, if you haven't been faithful with a little, he's not going to give you more. So there's principles that guide this. If you have never trusted God and if you've never bought a house and if you've never paid it off, for you to go and put down you know, your name, sign it to something that's a million dollar house and you can't pay rent on a $400 house, that's just wrong. The Word of God will tell you that's not God. It, it's not right. You know, I had one of our Bible college students that came to school in the very beginning, and he was a really nice guy. He was 40-something years old, but he had lived his whole life in mental institutions. I mean, from the time he was a, uh, before he was a teenager. And he had never worked a job. He got a government grant to go to some school, so he came to our Bible college. And he was a nice guy. I really liked him. And I started teaching him the book of Proverbs and we started in Proverbs chapter 1. It gives subtlety. It gives wisdom to the simple. And I said, God is going to teach you through this how to function. And so after a few weeks of me teaching him specifically one-on-one -on -one about believing God and trusting God, he came to me and he had made out an entire presentation. There's a place called the Cliff House down in Manitou Springs that at the time it had burnt and it was gutted. And it's like a 110 room hotel and it was stone but all of the interior had burnt and the thing had been derelict for over a, a decade. He came and found out how much it cost to buy it, how much it would cost to renovate it and then the number of rooms, time the rent, and he would rent it out to college students and on paper he showed that he could do all of this and turn a profit. And so he came to me and he says, look what God showed me. Look what God told me to do. I'm going to buy the cliff house and turn it into this nice Karis Bible College uh, dorm. And anyway, I complimented him. I said, Jerry, you know, it's good that you're thinking about this. I said, man, that's awesome. But I can guarantee you this is not God. And he was just, it's just like I popped his balloon. And he, why would you say that? He says, I put so much effort into it. And he had put a lot of effort and it was all good what he had done. 
He says, why would you say that? I said, Jerry, you have never worked a job in your life. You have never earned a dime. You have lived off of your parents and off of the government. I said, you go get a job and start paying your own rent and you buy your own food and you buy a car and you start doing these things and then come and show me this. And once you start going through these steps, then that'll be God. And you know what? It never came to pass. And stuff, and that's not, see, somebody says, well, God doesn't tell you to buy this, to do that. There's principles that guide all of it. One of them is, oh, no man, anything. Most people just ignore that principle. But the Word of God is a perfect representation of the mind of Christ. And so you pray, you delight yourself in the Lord and say, Father, I'm believing that you're giving me the desires of my heart. And then if you start having desires for something, you check it out. Does this conform to the Word of God? And if it's to get a new mate, no, it doesn't. <laughs> Somebody says, well, my mate's really bad. Well, the Bible says God hates divorce. He doesn't hate divorcees, he hates divorce. I've told one person to go ahead and get a divorce, but that's because... His wife tried to kill him and he tried to kill her and I said, divorce is not as bad as murder. <laughs> but in most cases, no, you shouldn't get a divorce, amen. That doesn't conform to the word. Well, I, I covet this over here. Man, I'm lusting for this. You know, the Bible says that you ask amiss, James chapter four, verse two, you ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you might consume it upon your own lust. If you are asking for something just because, man, you have to have this, you're, like, you're miserable if you don't have this house, this car, this toy, or whatever. Well, then, no, that desire is not from God because you're asking amiss that you can consume it upon your own lust. When you study the Word, you'll find out in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. You shouldn't seek things. You should seek God. And when you seek God, God will add things to you. It's a totally different system than this world operates in. It's not the wisdom of this world that comes to nothing. It's completely opposite. I tell our Bible college students, if you're short on tuition, and if you don't have enough to pay your tuition, then take that money and pay somebody else's tuition. And you know, the natural mind will say, that's stupid. I don't have my own tuition. But see, if what you have isn't enough for your need, then turn it into a seed and plant it. That's a Bible uh, principle. And I could share that with you from many different scriptures. And once you start thinking this way, once the Word of God starts permeating you, then your spirit man, the mind of Christ that's on the inside of you, will start giving you these desires to go bless somebody else, to put God first ahead of yourself, to deny yourself and exalt other people. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient under the cross. And for that reason, God's exalted him and given him a name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, every tongue would confess. Jesus tells you the way up in the kingdom of God is down. You humble yourself, he will exalt you. You put other people first. Instead of stabbing them in the back and saying, I'm going to get this territory. I'm going to get this promotion. Help somebody else. Help promote them. And many of you are thinking, well, that won't work. See, you're on a different frequency. You aren't listening to your spirit. You've been trained by this world and you are gonna, you're going to take advantage of people, hurt people. You know, one of the things that we do, I have people on my program. I have people that we interview on uh, uh, our inside story and just a lot of things. And I always tell my television department, I said, you put up their name, you put up their website, you put up their address, you tell people how to give directly to them. And for a long time, I mean, my TV department's used to it now, but for a long time they'd say, are you sure you want to do this? People are going to want to support them. And I said, man, if I build God's kingdom, God will take care of my kingdom. 
See, that's the way that the kingdom of God works. But I won't mention names. I could go on a lot of television networks and they'll have me on, but they will never put up my address. They will never let people know how to contact me because their partners might give to me instead of to them. That is insecure. That is not a godly attitude. That is not listening to the Spirit. Did you know the, the television network that begs for money the most and pressures people the most is the most restrictive on what you can say? They give me three minutes to advertise anything. And if I even mention that, you know, today I'm teaching on how to hear the voice of God, and by the way, I have a CD set or a DVD set on that, every second that I mention it or hold the product up or do anything, they count it against that. And if I go over three minutes, they reject my programs and kick them off. And yet they will spend over a week doing nothing but begging for money. That's not the Spirit of God. They aren't listening to the Spirit of God. And yet this is the way that the carnal mind thinks that, man, there's only a, there's a limited amount. There's only so much money in this pie. And if I give part of it to somebody else, what's going to happen to me? Well, I'll tell you what will happen to you. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. Man, when you can't outgive God. You start giving and blessing other people like that, and I guarantee you money's going to come back unto you wave upon wave. But see, that's your spirit speaking. But if you are living out of your mind and you're just thinking in the flesh, we have been taught, no, if you're short, hoard. Go take from somebody else. Certainly don't promote somebody else. If you want to be advanced, don't bless anybody else. Present them in the worst light possible and present yourself in the best light possible and, and even exaggerate and make it look better than it is. Amen or oh me. And I can guarantee you there's people right here in this auditorium that you have those attitudes and those values and you say, why isn't God speaking to him? He's speaking to you all of the time. But you have limited him. You don't accept that because it's not the way that you've been taught. And you're living out of your emotions. You're living out of your mind. You're living out of your carnal education instead of letting the Spirit of God teach you. This is how he teaches you. This teaches you how the, how the mind of Christ on the inside of you is. And he'll teach you all of these things. He'll teach you to speak to your mountain. He'll teach you that you can have what you say. Instead of saying what you have, you can have what you say. And he'll teach you how to start releasing things. I think I mentioned this last night, but a man said he had no power. He knew what the word said, but he just didn't have any power. And I said, Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of your tongue. You got power right here and you can start thinking differently. But anyway, the point I'm trying to get across is that you have the mind of Christ. You don't just have a little word from God every once in a while when you need it. You've got everything that God knows you know. It says in 1 John 2, 27, but the anointing which you have received of him abides within you and you need not that any man teach you. But as that same anointing teaches you, how does it go? But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things and is truth and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, you shall abide in him. You've got a special anointing. You know all things. But you've got to draw it out. And it starts by you've got to recognize that the written word of God is the mind of Christ on paper. But you've got the exact same thing on the inside. And so what you do, you study the word. Your spirit bears witness with what the word of God says. And when those two things match up, man, that's God. And you act on it. But you've got to start walking in the spirit. It can't be discerned in the natural. The natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. You've got to know things by the spirit. God just imparts things to you. You just know things. You don't know how you know it. You just know it. And it's happened to all of us to a degree, but I believe that we can get to where we walk in it and it becomes normal.